Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Thanks for being here. If you would, let's stand. and We're going to sing 364 if you want to use the hymnal. If not, you know, they'll be on the screens behind me. Got a couple folks to, for you to pray for. We'll give you five now and five a little bit later. Phil Wilson is in South Bay Hospital. Don't really know what for. We just got word that he's out there. Evan Rogers, which is Lauren Jones' brother, has some swollen lip nodes, and there is a fear that there may be some non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's been in the family. Denver Moore, uh, the Moore's children came to the school here and Denver is uh, very active in the Awana program. Denver's been in Tampa General Hospital now for about three weeks, and he's been a very sick man. He's starting to do a little better now, and his wife, Laura, has asked if the church would pray for him. And then Tim Horton had surgery on Tuesday at the VA. Tim Horton's been coming to church here probably three or four months. Uh, they moved here from Denver. Big fellow that sits right up in here, and he's got a cowboy look to him. He, he just looks like... Colorado. He walks like Colorado. So, and then Les Taylor has surgery tomorrow morning, uh, 730. Uh, please remember to pray for him. So Phil Wilson, Evan Rogers, Denver Moore, Tim Horton, Les Taylor. Now, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we ask for your attention to be given to these folk. For Phil Wilson in the hospital now, Denver Moore at Tampa General, Tim Horton still at VA, Les Taylor going in for surgery tomorrow. 
We ask, Lord, that you'd bless those surgeons with him. And we pray also for Evan Rogers. We pray that the tests will come back soon. We pray for good re return on those. We ask, Lord, that you'd do work in the lives of these, these men. And we pray that you would show them that you're real, increase their faith, even through their troubles and trials. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's good to see you. I understand that pastor was nice to me Sunday, so I'm thinking I may be missing next week too. I don't know, but uh, anyways, I was in the hospital for a few days and doing some better. They said take about 10 days or so, but I am still on antibiotics and doing a little bit and I uh, want to thank you those that have called or text or something. I really appreciate most of all, your prayers, so thank you so much. All right, well, we're getting towards the end of our list. Uh, we have tonight Dr. Stockton. Always look forward to his, Brother Glenn Stockton. Uh, just a great guy and uh, doing a good job. Uh, as you'll see from this letter, he's pretty much inactive at the moment because of all that's going on. But it says, Dear Pastor and friends, here we are in March. And the COVID-19 is still with us. I wonder if we will ever, if it'll ever go away. I guess we'll have to make the best of it. At least most churches are putting their services on the internet, and many people can hear it and be saved. I haven't been busy at all this past month, but I uh, do have something in March. Uh, it, but if you do, if you do have something in March, uh, give me a call, and I'll be glad to be of service to you. Thank you for your continued prayers and financial support, and we pray for you. May God continue to bless your ministries. And then it says, please send me your email address if you receive this letter. And if you would like it, I would ha I'll give you Dr. Stockton's uh, email there at the back. And uh, I know I mention this every time, but uh, just thought he always signs it, trusting him, Glenn Stockton, and then he ends it with the pastor's friend. And I just think that's so cool. I really like how he ends that, the, the pastor's friend. Brother Stockton, I know Pastor uh, worked for him for how many years, Pastor? Six years. And Brother Stockton's such a nice guy. I, I, I thought it might rub off, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> All right, getting my thoughts taken away here. Who's going to pray for Brother Stockton? Good fellow. He's been here many times. Uh, Mickey and I have had the opportunity to take him out for dinner, and uh, just a blessing to be with. All right. Our next missionary is uh, Brother and Mrs. Charles Strong, missionaries to Mexico. And we have them up there on the board, been serving here uh, as one of our missionaries since 99. And it says, uh, we have a letter from February and March. Both of these are current. And it says, Dear Pastor and Church, praise the Lord. He has kept us safe from the COVID so far, and we are here in a hot spot. But even in these uncertain times, we have our loving Heavenly Father, and we stand on the firm foundation of His Word, and we all say amen to that. In Rio Bravo, our services are going along still online and Facebook. The young people's services have grown and some of our young people in the Veracruz churches have connected and texting uh, that they have been blessed. Uh, the children's classes each Saturday uh, and at 4, uh, young people at 2 p.m. on uh, Sunday, and during the week, the ladies' meetings, and also the ladies receive a, a devotion each morning. So the Lord is blessing in spite of the COVID. May the Lord continue to bless you, each of you, and keep you safe in his loving care uh, as you serve him in your cities and around the world. We thank you again for your prayers and financial support uh, in his service, the Strongs. Good letter from them, good folks, doing a great job, many years, missionaries uh, there in Mexico. We'll be praying for them this week. All right, and our final one tonight are the Sykes. Uh, this is not the newest letter. It was right around Christmas time, uh, but we'll share it with you there in the Dominican Republic. And uh, it says here, super busy. It is understand. It's an under. 
statement to say that the time flies. It's hard to believe that we've been here for almost three months. We are a couple of weeks behind of our monthly updates and there is much to share. Uh, the last uh, two months have kept us very busy because of the COVID. We had many new adjustments from both the kids schooling and to church attendance. And then it says two emergency room visits. It says, we are so thankful for good insurance here. Uh, we got to try out our insurance with two different uh, emergency room visits back to back. Uh, Ellie, uh, their daughter had a birthday and they got her some new roller skates. Do I need to go any further? Okay, well they got her some new roller skates and uh, now see somebody read the letter already. But uh, it says here, uh, with two different emergency room visits, the Ellie received uh, some new rollerblades for her birthday, and within 20 minutes of, of unpacking them, she fractured her arm. So there they were, out there at the hospital. And uh, so we need to pray for that, but glad that they had insurance uh, to take care of that. Also, uh, they talk about the seminary that they'll be working with there. It says, I have been in several meetings recently concerning the relaunch of our seminary program. I, I'm excited to be a part of this intensive training process to send out new church planners into the harvest. Uh, again, COVID has played a big role in hindering this from getting started back. Thank you. We need your prayers. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your prayers and support and blessings and encouragement. If you don't currently financially support us, uh, would you consider it? After our survey trip in 2019, we began to schedule meetings uh, to our supporting level churches, uh, but then came COVID and pretty much shut everything down. Uh, it says, before our departure date, we are simply asking you to ask God what he would have you to do. Uh, there is a link at the bottom of the uh, web page here uh, that they can provide you how to get in touch with them. Any gifts uh, is tax deductible and our mission agency provides full financial accountability. Uh, it says, I absolutely hate raising money, but we currently need more support in planning of the seed through uh, our prayer letter. And we thank you again for your prayers and for your support. Again, remember us in prayers as we uh, endeavor on this new field and uh, the psychs. So we want to remember them in prayer. We'll be praying for the psychs, all right? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray for them, uh, for uh, their finances there, and also for uh, the Strongs there uh, in Mexico, uh, as they still are online, and then for Dr. Stockton, just pray that uh, the Lord will bless him with... Uh, getting some meetings and being able to get out and help the churches here, at least in the Florida and Georgia area. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for all of our missionaries. We, I think, have one of the greatest groups of missionaries that, of any church that I know of. And we thank you for Dr. Stockton, his faithfulness these many years. Of course, uh, just a couple of years ago, the loss of his wife, Sarah, and uh, the hardship that has been on him. But we pray for him and uh, for his work as he seeks to cover and fill in pulpits where he can. And so, God, we would pray that you'd bless that work there. And, Lord, we pray for the strongs there uh, in Mexico. We uh, pray for the uh, telecast as they go out, uh, for the churches there, because that's basically how they're uh, managing to keep in touch with their uh, flock. And so, God, we ask that you'd bless them. And for the Sykes, we just thank you for them as they're new to their field there in the Dominican Republic. And we pray for the healing uh, of uh, their little girl, Ellie, uh, who uh, fractured her arm. And Lord, we uh, just want to lift them up in prayer. And so many times we get concerned with our own needs and we forget the needs of others. And we just pray that you'd bless these three tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Brother Jim's going to come with another song.
stand and join me again as we sing 374 if you want to join us in the hymn book. If not, like I said, it'll be on the screen behind us. Wonderful, wonderful song. Great story behind it. We're not going to tell you tonight. We've told you before. Tommy Dorsey, that famous songwriter and singer from back years and years and years ago, uh, wrote this song upon the death of his wife. And so what a, what a sweet, sweet song. So join me. Precious Lord, take my hand. keep me from all wrong I'll be satisfied as long as I walk let me walk close to thee just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be when my feeble life is o'er. Time for me shall be no more. Guide me safely gently o'er to thy kingdom shore to thy shore just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear lord let it be just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close. 
close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Whoever played violin on that was having a good time. Got a couple more prayer requests for you. Dave Emules has a heart catheter tomorrow. Randall Reef was supposed to have heart oblation earlier this week, and he was postponed till April 19th. Ricky Gibson, which is Mickey's son, has hurt her back, his back, and cannot move. Three folks with cancer, Wilma Armstrong, Kathy Dean, and then uh, Leona Miller. Rebecca Welch Jakes is waiting for an MRI. Please pray for her. And Jane Martin is down, or is at, she has been at Tampa General Hospital, uh, and she's got some major medical issues, and also pray for her uh, husband. Uh, they rent from the McGraths, and I think that uh, the Martins were good friends with Chip's parents, have been family friends for years. Second Chronicles chapter 33, we're going to look at Manasseh tonight, uh, been asked by some ladies to get some character studies on the women. So I've got about half a dozen of them that I'm working on. Then I've got three bad boys and three good guys going to follow that. That'll get us easily into summertime. During the summer, we're planning on doing some different things. Uh, we're going to divide up into three groups, uh, teaching a marriage thing uh, for young families. As a matter of fact, it's not necessarily for young. It's just for folks who want to strengthen their marriage. And my wife and I are going to team teach that also be for child raising. Jim Farr is going to be teaching a class called Your First Baptist Church, teaches about the history of the church, plus also what our doctrinal distinctives are. And then Jerry is going to be teaching a class also, and I have no idea what Jerry's going to do yet on it because he went and got sick and we couldn't talk. But he's going to do something. He's going to have some kind of focus and go somewhere. Trust me. Manasseh is the oldest son of King Hezekiah. He was the 14th king of Judah. He became king at 12 years old, and he reigned for 55 years, from 698 B.C. to 643 B.C. He was the first king of Judah who did not reign while the northern kingdom, Israel, was still in force. That kingdom had been destroyed in the early part of Hezekiah's reign, and most of its citizens were deported to Assyria. That happened in 720 B.C. Manasseh reversed the religious changes made by his father. Judah had gone way, way away from God. Hezekiah had extra 10, 15 years, and he brought them back. Manasseh ignored all those changes, reinstituted polytheistic worship. There are some that believe that Manasseh reigned with his father as co-regent for the 12 years before he was biblically recorded as ascending to the throne. And I, I read that and tried to find out, and I think it's just what somebody came up with. I have no idea where they came up with it. I found one guy that believed it, another guy that believed it, but they, they offered no proof at all. Whenever that kind of thing happens, when I read that, I go, okay, it's somebody's opinion. I'll stick with the Scripture. If the Bible doesn't say it, I'm not going with it, but I'll at least let you know there are folks that think that. Uh, it, there might have been a reason for that. It could have been that uh, Hezekiah saw something in his son that he was a little concerned about. Plus, Hezekiah also knew he wasn't going to live long. God had told him how long he was going to live, and he wanted to get as much in his son as he could, but it didn't work. The Messiah biblical account is found in 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Chronicles 32 and 33. He's also mentioned by the prophet Jeremiah in the prophet's prediction that the Lord was going to bring four forms of death and destruction upon the nation. Jeremiah 15, 2 says, such as are from death to death and such as are for the sword to the sword and such as are for the famine to the famine and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Verse 3 tells how the troubles are going to come. I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour 
and destroy. And then in verse 4 of Jeremiah, he tells them why. I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth because Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, of king of Judah, for that he did in Jerusalem. Imagine being the king and that prophecy is given. I'm going to punish this nation greatly because of your king and what he's done. Manasseh had a relationship with Assyria. Sennacherib reigned from 61 80, 80, 681 was king of Assyria. Manasseh is actually mentioned in the Assyrian records as a contemporary and a loyal vassal of Sennacherib's son and successor. Assyrian records also list Manasseh as one of 22 kings who were required to provide materials for the building projects of Sennacherib's son. That son, whose name was Esar Hayden, died in 669 B.C. and was succeeded by his son, who also names Manasseh as one of the number of vassals who assisted in his military campaign against Egypt. Now, although the biblical texts are filled with criticisms of Manasseh's religious policies, there are archaeologists who credit Manasseh with reviving Judah's economy, especially the rural economy. Speculation is that Manasseh made use of a designation from Assyria of most favored nation, a result of his being friends with the Assyrian kings, three of them, and he created an export market for farm goods, which helped the nation come back and become very prosperous. But his religious policies were a problem. Three aspects of Manasseh's religious policy brought criticism from the prophets. First of all, he led an apostasy. Second of all, he reintroduced and had idolatry accepted by the people. And thirdly, he led in a persecution of the prophets. Those prophets had helped Hezekiah with the reforms he instituted, and now his son Manasseh goes after those very people. As Manasseh reversed the reforms of Hezekiah, he reestablished local shrines, maybe for economic reasons. He also restored the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth and Moloch, even using the temple in Jerusalem as the place where those gods would be worshipped. And yet God was still at work in Judah. Even during the reign of Manasseh, the Lord spake by his servants to the prophets. You'll find that in 2 Kings 21.10. Those prophets were probably Isaiah, Habakkuk, Nahum, Zephaniah, maybe Jeremiah as well, since Jeremiah mentioned him. His response to these prophets speaking out was to persecute and kill them. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 30 mentions that they were being killed with the sword. For many decades, those who had sympathized with the prophets lived in constant peril. Viewpoint discrimination. I say it because we're finding this kind of stuff in America now, too. Recently, there was a policeman from Los Angeles who lost his job because he went to a Trump rally. That's why he was fired. He went to a Trump rally. I hope he sues him. Yep. I hope he gets a good load of money out of him. Hezekiah had a really good example to follow. It was his dad... I'm sorry, Manasseh had a good example, and it was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of Israel's best kings. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to 2 Chronicles 29.2. And he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. That's 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 5. Hezekiah reigned for Israel for 25 years, and he died when Manasseh was 12. He left the young Manasseh a good example of what to do and how to behave in that which mattered most for kings. Hezekiah left an example in reigning. He left an example in religion. And he left an example in riches. Let's read 2 Chronicles chapter 32, 27. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor. And he made himself treasures for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices, and for shields, and for all manner of pleasant jewels, storehouses also for the increase of corn, and wine, and oil, and stalls for all manner of beasts, and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities, 
and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him much substance, had substance very much. Troublous Manasseh was affected by the same disease that affects a lot of folks in our modern day culture in the United States of America, and that disease is this. I'm smarter than everybody that came before me. I don't need to know what they did. I don't need to know why they did it. I know better than what everybody did, knows before me. Our contemporary culture right now, we are judging the founding fathers who lived in the 17th and 18th centuries according to moral standards of the 21st century. And the standards aren't really moral standards. They're pseudo-moral standards. We're tearing down statues. We're removing names of our founding fathers from schools as if those men were not worthy of examples and worthy of being followed. Manasseh, like these people today, instead of learning and following the good examples, decided to go his own way and do what he thought was best. It did not work well for Manasseh, and it will not work well for America if we continue down this path. It's going to hurt us. Manasseh went deep into sin, and his life spun out of control. By his sin, he provoked the Lord to anger. Chapter 33, verse 3 through verse 7. He changed the means and the manners, the methods, and even the object of worship. He practiced false religion. Verse 3 says, For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Manasseh did not just ignore his father's example. He returned to that which his father had rejected and removed. The Lord, Jehovah, was replaced by Balaam. Jehovah, the God of heaven and earth, was to be worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem. Baal worship, which is worship of the sun, moon, stars, was practiced in altars surrounded by trees. It's called the groves. Baal worship preceded, by the way, the Greek and Roman mythology. There is some real strong speculation that the Canaanite god Baal actually became the Greek god Jupiter and the Roman god Zeus also named Belos. By the way, the name Baal translated as Lord. What a great name for a false god. So here in Israel, we take the Lord, God Jehovah, and replace him with the Baal, with the Lord. In verse 4 and 5, Manasseh led in the mixture of truth and error. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Along with the altars in the groves, altars to Baal, he built altars in the traditional places where that Jehovah was worshipped. In the temple of Solomon, the house of the Lord. There were two courts. There was an inner court and an outer court. The outer court was for the people. The inner court was for the priests and the Levites. Manasseh desecrated the temple by setting up altars to idols in each of those courts. He used a sanctified location for an unsanctified vocation. He defiled a holy place with an altar dedicated to an idol, a false god named Baal, Lord. The mixing of truth and error is very dangerous. If you mix that which is true and that which is false or that which is a lie, it can be more dangerous than a whole lie. A half-truth can be more deadly than a whole lie for this reason. If someone recognizes the half-truth as being true, they are very likely to accept the whole statement as being true. Well, I'm not certain about the last part, but I do know that the front part is right. Therefore, I'm just going to assume that the last part's right too. A half-truth is a whole lie, and it is a dangerous lie at that. And so using a simple, something as simple as a location of worship, the truth and lies were mixed it's a dangerous thing when a location for worship is used for that other 
purpose, for a purpose other than presenting the Word of God. It's happening in America too, folks. There are churches all over this country who are leaving the study of the Word of God. They talk TED Talks. They do psychology. There's very little Bible study. And it's, by the way, there's a good reason why there's very little Bible study. Studying the Bible is work. Writing a sermon can be pretty easy. You can write a sermon in a couple hours. You say whatever you want to say. Find a scripture verse to match it if you like. But writing a sermon, finding out what the Word of God says and exegeting it and pulling it out, finding exactly what it said, doing the history is simply a lot of work. And we're living in a pretty lazy society. Manasseh also turned the righteousness of worship not just into something not for God. It became all out sin. At the end of verse 6, Scripture says that Manasseh wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. There were several things that provoked the Lord to anger about Manasseh. One of them was child sacrifice, verse 6. He caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Manasseh was a true believer. He did not just cause the children of other people to be sacrificed in the fire. He sacrificed his own children to die in the fire. The valley of the son of Hinnom eventually became the trash dump of Jerusalem. No one wanted to own the land which had been desecrated by child sacrifice, and so no one would own it, and people began to start throwing their trash there. Somebody started a fire sometime, and for too long, it became known as a place of underground fires. In the Greek, that valley of Hinnom is called Gehenna. Gehenna means the place of underground fires. It's also a word used in the New Testament for Hades or hell. It is the place of disembodied spirits, a place of torture, a place of vileness, and a place of death. Every time I think about the child sacrifice of the Old Testament, what comes to mind is the child sacrifice in our day, which is abortion. Something like 50 to 60 million children have been killed in their mother's wombs in the United States of America. Do you know one of the reasons why we have an, abor an immigration issue right now? There are po politicians who want more people to come to America. They're realizing that if America doesn't keep growing, we're, our economy is going to slow down and stop. There are plenty of European places where their population is flat. They brought in Muslims. They've got problems. What's happening in America is we're killing our own offspring, and instead of our nation growing as it normally naturally should, we've got problems. Imagine, if, if, by the way, if you're on Social Security, imagine an extra 50 million people paying Social Security what would that do for the system? If you complain that you haven't had a Social Security raise in years, there's a good reason why. We, we are reaping what we've sown on the financial side of it. I think probably on the moral side as well. How about another one? Still in verse 6, he observed times. That's fortune-telling. Horoscope, astrology, I don't believe that either of them work, but I think you should probably stay away from all of them. There's, it's quite possible that they could be demonically influenced. I, I, when I was a kid, I used to read the, the astrology things just to make fun of them. I mean, they, they had an art of saying nothing when they said something. I mean, it's so open, so crazy. By the way, this is not astronomy, which is stud, the study of the stars. This is astrology, tarot cards trying to tell the future. Witchcraft, still in verse 6, used enchantments and used witchcraft. A little later on, it's wizards. By the way, a wizard is a male witch. 
Witchcraft is the work of Satan and demons. By the way, remember earlier I told you that this generation thinks we're smarter than everybody before us? See, everybody before us recognized that they were both male and female. There would be a witch and a wizard. And today we have a man and a woman and who knows what's in the middle. Matter of fact, there are people in America who are now not putting the child's name, child's sex on the birth certificate. They'll choose when they get older. These people, are they're mentally ill. By the way, this is my opinion. That mental illness is schooled in college. The longer you've been in college, secular college, the more likely you are to pick up on this kind of stupidity. It has to be taught to you. You don't learn it on your own. It's common sense. The problem is in the, our country right now, whenever a politician or a professor talks about common sense, if you have common sense, what they say about common sense will not make common sense to you. When we want common sense immigration. We want common sense gun control. I'm sorry. By the way, we've had two mass shootings in the last two weeks. In both sides, our media has come out with lies about it. The first one they claim was racial because six of the women were oriental. Come to find out, not a race problem at all. The guy was mentally ill. He's, he didn't care what their race was. He killed one white, one Hispanic, and six orientals. But they blamed it on race. The one in Colorado, I don't know if you noticed or not, they called him a white guy. That's race. Come to find out, but they called him a white Christian. I've heard complaints today on the radio. They, why, they, why don't they talk about the white Christians who commit murder? Well, because Christianity doesn't condone murder, and Islam does. So therefore, it's fair, since Islam promotes the murder of those who are non-Islamic, it's fair to say he was Islamic. He was Syrian-born, raised in America. In my opinion, by the way, he also, according to his own family, had mental problems. In my opinion, the racists in America right now are in Congress and on the media. They're the ones promoting racism. They're the ones who are claiming racism, and then they have to walk it back. The racists are those who are always talking about race. I remember Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King talking about, let's get off the skin color. Let's talk about the content of someone's character. That's no longer being spoken about anymore. I mean, they don't even honor him anymore as far as that goes. That's the way it ought to be. How about another one? Demonism. He dealt with a familiar spirit, demon possession, or at the least, demonic influence. So he mixed truth with error. He turned righteousness of worship into sin, and now he defiles the temple with idolatry, verse 7. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Manasseh illustrates something that has confounded me for most of my life. How is it and why is it that human beings are not afraid of offending God? We'll use God's name. Not afraid of him. Verse 4 and 5, he built altars in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He put the altars on or above the, the excuse me, the idols on or above the altars. He worshiped a false god named Lord Baal. He took the idols that represented the false god into the one place that was reserved for Israel's one and only true God. And in this, he provoked God to anger. But there's more. He promoted sin among his people. Verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Bad leadership destroys nations. 
And people who know God and then choose to go against what they know can be worse than those who don't know God. A reprobate is worse than a heathen in behavior. Manasseh took a really good situation, which he inherited from Hezekiah, and then he influenced his people to err in matters in judgment, to do worse than the heathen in behavior. Kind of reminds me of our president now. It took a pretty good situation, and on day one, he caused himself some problems, and we've got immigration problems right now because he didn't recognize that something had been successful. This is what Manasseh did to Hezekiah. Manasseh looked at Hezekiah and said, everything he's done is wrong. Therefore, I'm going to change it all. Joe Biden's done the same thing with Donald Trump. Donald Trump was not perfect. But you could look at the things that he did well and go, I think I'll keep that one. That's working really well. That, that, that would just be intelligent. Yes, I know what I just did. Okay. <laughs> I do pray for Joe Biden. I pray for him for a lot of reasons. I pray for his mental. I don't think he's in, 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 I think he's incapacitated. But even when he was sharp, he was wrong on more things than he was ever right on. I mean, I, Manasseh had, Manasseh had an influence over people which he took advantage of, and he hurt God's people. When God's people reject righteousness, ignore their conscience, insult their God, there seems to be no limits on the depravity to which they can sink. What, what Manasseh was doing is called a presumptuous sin. A presumptuous sin is referred to in Psalm 19.13. It says, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. A, a presumptuous sin is a sin that you know better than to get involved in and do it anyway. They are extremely dangerous. Young person goes to a party at the party, hard liquor is brought out and drugs. That young person knows better than to stay. He knows better than to partake in either the liquor or the drugs. He knows better, and if he stays and partakes, it's a presumptuous sin, and the payment price is heavy. If he is a child of God, child, God just may take that child and spank them severely. I cannot tell you how many young times, how many times I've witnessed or counseled with young people who said, I only did it one time and I got caught. My comment usually is, praise God for that. I mean, if you get spanked the first time you do something wrong, you're probably going to say, I'm not doing that again. It ain't worth it. Good parenting right there, folks. Catch your kid doing something wrong, make a big issue of it the first time, and the kid will go, mm, not doing that again. No way. My wife tells the story that one time she, in the yard, someone had thrown a, a beer bottle. She went outside, picked up the beer bottle to sniff it, and her mother looked out the window. Vicky said, I'll never touch a beer bottle in my life again. I mean, she sees a beer bottle, it's like seeing a snake. <laughs> Her mother made a real point. I didn't do that, but one time I was riding my bicycle, about 11 or 12 years old, the last year we had a babysitter, and I was riding to the babysitter, and lo and behold, I found a little can, a little flat can, green. I think it was skull. Had not been opened. There it is, sitting in the, in the gutter. I pick it up. I open that thing up, and I did just what I saw others do. I couldn't get that stuff out of there fast enough. 
I, I dug and dug and dug trying to get that. That is the nastiest stuff in the world. And some people pay good money for it. I spit it out. I tell that story because my mother is no longer alive and she can't hear me. This, because <laughs> boy, would she have been upset if she had seen that. Verse ten: Manasseh ignored the word of God. The Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Manasseh had a godly example. He had God's word, the law and the prophets. He ignored both the good example and God's word. He even ignored God's voice. God has a lot of ways to speak to us. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through our conscience. In scripture, he spoke to folks through dreams. He can also speak to us to a voice. C.S. Lewis wrote this. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience but shouts in our pains. That's the top one, C.S. Lewis's version. The bottom one's the version I like and I put together. Based upon C.S. Lewis, I like my version better, but I couldn't have come up with it on my own. So here's my version. God whispers to us through our conscience. God speaks to us through his word, and God screams at us through adversity. I like the bottom one better because it fits my life. I find that God speaks to to me in my conscience. He speaks to me through his word. And if I don't listen to my conscience or his word and I still go wrong, I get adversity. And he really does get my attention. And I'll say things like, I'm never going to do that again. Manasseh had mastered the art of ignoring God's word, God's voice. So it's time for adversity. Did you notice it was not just the king who was addressed by the voice of God? God spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not hearken. The entire congregation of God's people ignored God's will for them. They all forsook him. Do you know why? They followed their leader. Doesn't matter who the leader is, they'll be followed. In the United States of America right now, it's about 50 50. It doesn't matter who the leader is, about half of our nation will follow him. Sometimes it's the same half, but whichever way we go, we're, we are followers. We are strongly influenced by our leaders. Well, Manasseh. To have adversity, God got his attention, and he was greatly punished. His past sins became his present trouble. Verse 11. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Fetters are the things that go on your wrist, on your ankles. Chains go between them. His sin was punished. Manasseh was brought in chains to Assyria to stand before the king. Some think that this was for suspected disloyalty. Doesn't really matter what it's for. The lesson is quite plain. There are times when God uses the lost to punish his children. You disobey the Lord. He just might let the horde of Assyria in on you get your attention, spank you really hard. You may come out of it, you may not. The severity of Manasseh's imprisonment and punishment brought him to repentance. And as a result, in verse 12 through 16, his past sin was replaced with several things. The first was a personal humility, verse 12. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of of his fathers. Sin replaced with humility. And with prayer, verse 13, and prayed unto him, and he, God, was entreated of him, as Manasseh, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. How long it took, we're not told here. But eventually he did get back. 
And then he returned to his right mind, verse 13 still. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. You know, you can rely on faith to know God is God, or you can rely on experience to know God is God. They both work. One of them's more expensive than the other one. If you don't believe God, you just might get to pay the price. If you don't trust him, you don't obey him, he has ways to get you back. There's another thing about him. He, he, once he had repented and prayed and returned to a right mind, he began to practice good works. He did right things, 14 through verse 16. After this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gion, in the valley, even to the entering at the fish gate, encompassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fin cities of Jerusalem. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and the altars that he had built on the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed there on peace offerings and thank offerings. I'm going to come back to hit that stuff again, make comments, but the problem was he was alone in doing good because the people didn't follow him. Verse the second part of verse 16 and verse 17. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places. Yet unto the Lord their God only. Compromise. The high places, not where they were supposed to be sacrificing. You know, after he was restored to his throne, he abandoned the false worship and idolatry. That's 12 and 13. He built a wall around Jerusalem. That's verse 14. He protected the people who did not live in the capital. That's verse 14. I'm going to comment right there. Isn't it interesting how our people who represent us in Washington, D.C. behave so differently when an attack was on their city than when it was in Portland or Seattle? or Milwaukee, or Houston, or St. Louis, or anywhere else. Our representatives in Washington let riots go on in this country for almost a year, never doing a thing. Except sometimes they would say, well, they ought to be going on. Our vice president currently said it should be happening and it should continue to happen. That's the riots. That's what she said. We rewarded her for that by giving her the second highest office in the land. I think half of America has lost its mind. I I don't understand why we would do that, but we did. You know, when you get to have a godly mindset, you start caring about the things of others more than just the things of yourself. Philippians chapter Two tells us to look not only on our own things, but on the things of others. And when, Hez, when Manasseh got to the place where he's now serving the Lord, he's not just concerned about Manasseh. He's concerned about others as well. He removed the idols, repaired the altars, implored the people to worship. He did well, really well at leading the people away from God, but he couldn't lead them all the way back to God. It's a sad truth about sin in people. It is easier to get someone to sin with you than to get them to stop sinning. Human nature is that we are sinners by nature. It is easier to get someone to sin than to get them to stop. And one last thing. Manasseh experienced the grace of God. In spite of his life of sin, Manasseh was treated very well by God. Chapter 33, verse 18. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord, that's the prophets, Lord God of Israel. Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sin and his trespass and the places wherein he built high places and set up groves and graven image before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. 
So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house, and Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. After the longest reign as king of any king in the history of Judah, he died and was buried in the garden of his own house rather than in Jerusalem. Rather than be buried among the ancestors, he's buried at home. He had a son that succeeded him on his death. By the way, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Ammon, granddad's son, grandson, are all mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew's account in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The phrase slept with his fathers is used to indicate that he went to be with Abraham. Remember the story of Jesus telling of Lazarus who died and went to Abraham's bosom? And the rich man died and in hell lifted up his eyes and was in torment. But Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom and the rich man is in Hades. That was a temporary place where people who died in the Old Testament before Jesus Christ died on the cross, that Abraham's bosom was the temporary holding place while they waited for the sacrifice for their sins to be completed. It was like heaven's waiting room. When Christ died on the cross, during the three days he was buried, he actually went to that place and cleaned it out and took those people to heaven with him. It's found in the book of Ephesians, I'm pretty certain. I haven't studied it in in a couple of years, but it is a fascinating story that he went through, Jesus Christ went to the belly of the earth to grab the captives, and he called the captives out and freed them. So, Manasseh went to be with Abraham. How can a guy with this sin account that Manasseh had go to heaven? It's called grace. I mean, if if Manasseh got what he deserved, he would have split hell wide open. He'd have been over there next to the rich man who was suffering in torment and flame. But he repented. He came back to God. God forgave him of his sins. The lesson of Manasseh is this. Number one, sin ruins lives. Number two, God forgives sin. Number three, sin is paid for on this earth by believers and paid for throughout eternity by unbelievers, and heaven has always been the gift of God. There are certain things never change. Sin ruined lives. God forgives sin. Sin has a price tag, and heaven is a free gift. It's both Old and New Testament. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this man. We wish he had done better before he messed up. We wish he had lived wisely, followed his father's example. But by not doing so, we are offered a pretty good example of how LifeGate works. And we see through the life of Manasseh how you work. And for that, we are grateful. And we're thankful that this man, in spite of all his sin, gets to spend eternity with you. We're grateful for the grace of God that he experienced and that we too have experienced. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a good night.